Welcome Accounting Boffins. You are with Ashraf Patel and the crew. Today, we're looking at cash budgets. However, we're looking at a particular question as it applies to a cash budget. So, let's just go quickly and see what we have. Remember what we've done before. In budgets, you have your receipts and your payments, right? So, what do you remember? When you're doing budgets, you think cash. All the cash that we are receiving and all the cash that we are paying out. Okay, then when it comes to your projected income statement, obviously, there you're looking at what you're looking at, your projected income statement. You're looking at incomes that you have earned as compared to expenses that you have incurred. Okay, look at the terminology that we're using there so you know exactly what it refers to. Right, our question here says, information. The information provided relates to live wire traders owned by Debbie Prince. The business specializes in electrical products. Their financial year ends on the 31st of December, 2020. Right, that's the information that you have. Okay, now the question says, indicate whether each of the following statements, whether they are true or false, right? The first question says, the balance on the cash budget represents profit earned. Right, what did we just say early on in the lesson? We said that a cash budget, you think cash, you think receipts and payments. Now, this statement says, the balance on the cash budget Right, so we're talking about the cash budget, but it says represents the profit that we have earned. Clearly you can see that this is false. Reason, what the, the, the cash budget would give you the balance of your bank account. That means it would give you the balance of your receipts and payments and therefore not the profit that you have earned. If you want it to work out the profit that you have earned, that would come from your statement of income and expenditure, your projected income and expenditure. Okay. The next one says, all projected receipts and payments are recorded in the cash budget. All right, let's analyze the statement one more time. All projected, right? So definitely we're working with the projection, we're forecasting. Receipts and payments immediately should give you an indication. Are we talking about the projected income statement or are we talking about the cash budget? It says here, recorded in the cash budget. Clearly you can see that that is true. Why? Your statement of receipts and payments is reflected in your cash budget. Okay, so it's important for you to understand that these theory types of questions, you need to understand what are they asking you for. So you must understand what the concept is and then obviously say whether it is true or false. The next one says, again we're talking about whether the statement is true or false. Profit on sale of asset will increase the balance on the cash budget. Okay, think carefully. When you're disposing of an asset, right, you've got the selling price, you've got the cost price, you've got the depreciation, you've got the accumulated depreciation, all those components that we generally calculate when we're working out the asset disposal. The question here says, the profit on sale of asset, that one, we're talking specifically about the profit, not the selling price, will increase the balance on the cash budget. And obviously, you now need to ask yourself, the profit on sale of asset, is it my receipt? And the answer is an emphatic no. Why? Because the selling price is what we record in our cash budget. But the profit that you have made on the disposal of an asset is recorded in my statement, in my projected income statement. So clearly you can see here that in this question here, 
this statement is actually false. Why? Because the profit on sale of asset is recorded in my statement of comprehensive income, also known as my income statement, whereas the actual selling price of the asset is recorded in my cash budget. Okay, clear, got that, brilliant, let's move on. 17,000 Rand, again we're busy with a statement whether it is true or false, 17,000 Rand received for selling equipment must appear in the projected income statement as an operating income. All right, watch this question now. 17,000 Rand that you have received, right? For what? For selling old equipment must appear in the projected income statement. Clearly you can see now. We're talking about the monies that we have received, but the statement says it must be recorded in my projected income statement. Clearly you can see the statement is false. Why is it false? You give me the answer. Very simple. The amount that you've received on the disposal of the equipment goes to my cash budget. Remember the previous question? Yes, if this had said 17,000 Rand must appear in my, project, in my uh, cash budget, then definitely it would be true. But because it's saying it must appear in my op as an operating income, absolutely incorrect, so the statement is false. How would we correct it? We would say that the profit made on the disposal of an asset will appear as an income in my projected income statement. Okay, so clarify it once again. This one here is the selling price of 17,000 and this needs to be recorded in my cash budget. Therefore, this statement is false. Okay, we're now looking at a cash budget and the question says, identify an incorrect entry in the cash budget and explain why it is incorrect. Okay, let's look at the information that we have. There's my cash budget. Let's go through all of these items so that we have a clear understanding of whether they belong there or not. Let's start off by saying advertising. Certainly an expense, so it will go into my cash budget. Telephone, another expense, will definitely go into my cash budget. Vehicle expenses, yes, will definitely go into my cash budget. Rent expense, land and buildings, obviously if I'm buying land and buildings, the purchase of the land and buildings will be recorded in my cash budget. Municipal rates, yes, definitely. Depreciation, let's talk about it. What is depreciation? Depreciation, as we have alluded in previous lessons, is what we refer to as an imputed expense. Let me explain. What do we mean by an imputed expense? It is an expense that does not affect the flow of funds. I repeat, it is an expense that does not impact on the flow of funds. In other words, there's no money leaving our business when we are recording depreciation. Therefore, you can clearly see that depreciation should not appear in my cash budget. Yes, interest on loan, equipment, drawings, if the owner is taking cash, would appear. So all of all of these items, this one here, depreciation is the one that does not appear in my cash budget. And the reason, we've made it very clear to you, is that it is an imputed expense. It's an expense that does not affect the flow of funds and therefore, therefore, does not feature in my cash budget. Okay. So there we go. We explained it, that it is depreciation and the reason why it is a non-cash item. Okay, while we're at it, can you think of another non-cash item that would not appear in your cash budget? Let's take an example. If you look at bad debts. Remember, when you have bad debts, yes, this is an expense 
to the business. We all know that. The account is written off as irrecoverable. However, it's no money. It doesn't affect our bank balance because there's no money leaving the business. There are other cash items that you can think of. Discount received, discount allowed. Think of those items. Okay. Now we come to a question that says, state three ways in which land and buildings can be financed. If we look at our information here, you can clearly see that we need to purchase land and buildings, right? Now, how would you finance the land and buildings? Again, look at the nature of the question. They want to elicit a response from you asking you how would you finance the land and buildings, okay? Let's look at the ways in which the land and buildings can be financed. One, there's an additional loan of 400,000 Rand, okay? Based on your given information, obviously, you'll have to look for that information and find out that there's an additional loan that was taken to the value of 400,000 Rand. And therefore, you can see that as you have taken that loan, that loan will allow you to finance the land and buildings, right? Two, a fixed deposit has matured. Obviously, we know what the fixed deposit. Let's look at the two possibilities. One, a fixed deposit that we make. That means we take money out of our bank account and put it into a fixed deposit is regarded as a payment. Why? The money is taken out of my bank account and put it into a fixed deposit, thereby leaving our bank account. Therefore, that is regarded as a payment and will appear under the payment section of my cash budget. However, when a fixed deposit matures, you have money flowing into our bank account, okay? And obviously, that would then appear as a receipt. Why? The fixed deposit has now matured, the money is coming back into our bank account, so it's an inflow of cash, and therefore, that will be shown as a receipt. And then clearly, you look at your bank balance at the end of your budget period, and in this case here, there was a closing balance of 550,000 Rand, meaning that after you have subtracted your receipts minus your payments, right, you had a surplus of cash to the value of 550,000 Rand, and as a result of that, you can clearly see that you can use that cash that you have as a surplus to finance your land and buildings. So, what is important, accounting learners out there, is to look at the information, look at the context of the question. And based on that context, you will then have to answer the questions based on the questions that are given to you. Okay, so what have we done? Clearly you can see, and this was very, very evident in what we have done in this segment of our lesson. You, 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 the question focused on the cash budget and the projected income statement. In other words, you had to clearly identify, although the question was asked in the form of true and false, you had to identify the item, whether it would appear in my cash budget or whether it would appear in my projected income statement. So clearly, if we have to summarize, cash budget, you think cash, you think actual receipts and actual payments, whereas your projected income statement, you look at incomes that you have earned and expenses that you have incurred. Before we conclude, let's just take one example so that we, we, we know for sure we understand the difference between the two. Let's take the question of a fixed deposit that you have made, okay? So you've invested money into your fixed deposit, an amount of 500,000 Rand. Obviously, that will go into your cash budget as a payment because it's money leaving your bank account. However, the interest that you have received, the interest that you have received on the fixed deposit will also go into my cash budget as a receipt. But the interest that you have earned 
If there's a difference between the two, the interest that you have earned will go into your projected income statement. That means the entire amount. So if we illustrate and we say there was interest that was earned to the value of 10,000 Rand, so the 10,000 Rand will go into my projected income statement. And if we're looking at the, the interest that we have received, if we've received 5,000 of that amount, 5,000 Rand will go into my cash budget as a receipt. So clearly you can see the difference between receipts and payments, incomes that we have earned, and expenses that we have incurred. Let's take a quick break, and as soon as we're ready, we'll be back with you with cash budgets. See you just now. Welcome back, accounting boffins. Right, remember, we're busy with cash budgets. We're looking at an actual question. Quick recap in terms of our budget. We're talking about receipts. And obviously, we have the information that we have here is that we're talking about our cash budget. And our information that we have here is that we have the receipts, payments, and we've spoken plenty about it, so we're not going to go back into that part of it. What do we go to the question and we see there that, again, we're dealing with the business, live wire traders, and what is it that is required of us now? We are expected to complete the debtors collection schedule for the budgeted period. Now, remember, your debtors collection schedule, a quick recap, is based on credit sales, number one. So the most important component is your credit sales. Number two, you look at the proviso. How are your debtors expected to pay you? There's a certain uh, grid that you are given information on telling you this percentage in this month, this percentage in the next month, and that's what we then use in terms of our calculations. And remember, ultimately, your, your debtors collection schedule will fit into your cash budget, where you will have an item that says receipts from debtors. And that's where your debtors collection schedule actually fits in. Okay, now, what are we told? Debtors are granted 30 days to settle their accounts as per policy. However, debtors, the payment uh, pattern is as follows. 20% pay in the month of sale, subjected to a discount of 5%. 30% will pay in the month following the month of sale. 48% will pay in the following month. And the remaining 2% must be written off in the third month as a bad debt, as an irrecoverable debt. Okay, now this is what we have. We are also told that 75% of all sales are on credit, right? And your projected credit sales for September will be 180,000. Okay, so that's the information that we have. Okay, so now we go into our question and we say, fine. There's my August sale, right? And there's my credit sale is given to me. So clearly I can see that I have a credit sale already given to me. So there's no need to convert my total sales into credit sales. That's very, very important. Okay. We are expected to calculate the following. Here we can see that we are given the September sale of 150,000 Rand, right? And we're now going to use our proviso. Remember, our budget period is October and November. Right, so taking my September sale now into consideration, which is 150,000 Rand, I want to know what amount will I receive from my debtors for the month of October. So once again, the proviso is important. We said 20% in the month of sale, so September 20%. October will be 30%. So immediately I go and do this here. What will I do? I take my October, I take my September sales, 
to, to calculate the amount that I'm going to receive in October, and this is what I do. Take your 150,000, right, times uh, your 30%, okay, and that gives you a figure of 45,000. So this means, therefore, that this figure here that we are looking for, there is my 45,000. Can you see? It is based on my September sale. Clear. Then I look at my September sale again in order to calculate my November figure. Once again, I look at my proviso, and my proviso tells me that 48% will pay in the, in, the, in the following month. So what do I do? Once again, go back here, take my 150,000, 150,000 times my 48%, and that will give me a figure of 72,000 Rand. Okay, let's do that. So we can see that that figure is 72,000. Let's go into my calculation. There's my 72,000 Rand. So clearly you can see what are we doing. We're using the base month as the month of sale, whichever you are expected to calculate. you then applying the conditions as to how our debtors are paying us. So there we got September done and dusted. Okay. Now we go on and we work with October, where the October sale was 165,000 Rand. Okay, so there we have it. 165,000 Rand for October. Firstly, we are told 20%. Let's just verify that information. 20% pay in the month of sale. But now be careful on this one here because 20% pay in the month of sale subject to a discount of 5%. Okay, now what do we know? We know that we're working with the 20%. Let's do that. So we have 165,000. Let's cancel that. 165,000 times my 20% will give me that, times 95% will give me a figure of 31,350. Okay, here we go. There you can see 31,350. Now, just a quick recap. Let me go through my calculation again. One, you took your sale for October, which was 165,000, right? I'm going to write it here. So it's 165,000, step number one, times the 20% times the 95%. Why? Because if they settled in the month of sale, they are subjected to a discount of 5%. And as a result of the discount, you're now only going to receive 95%, and you saw the calculation. There we have 31,350. Okay, then we went on to, still with, with the October one, but the impact on November, and we know that that is the 30%. So it's 165,000, 165,000. Times the 30%. Okay, so 45,500. And that should give a figure of 49,500. Let's check. There's my 49,500 that I'm expected to receive in November based on my October sale. So clearly you can see, guys, what is important here is firstly identify your credit sale. Number two, look at the pattern in which your debtors are paying you in terms of your percentages. And then it's a calculator skill just to work out your percentages. Okay, let's move on. Here we go. So now we have a completed, we've completed all the components of my debtors collection schedule. Remember, November, once again, I think that was the last one that we had to complete. If you looked at November, is 180,000. Let's do that calculation. 180,000 times, in the month of November, 20%. Let's not forget 
the 95%. Why? Because they are entitled to a 5% discount. Okay, so if we do that one there, let's take the 180,000, 180,000 times your 20% is equal to that, times the 95%, and you will see that you get an answer of 34,200. There we go. There's the 34,200 for November. Once again, look at your calculations, and clearly you can see that each of these months will impact on my budget period, which is October and November. Okay, this then gives you your completed debtors collection schedule, where you now add up all the components that you have in your debtors collection schedule for October, for November, and obviously, this is my budget period, October and November, and you can see that August, September, October, and November impacted on my budget period, and therefore, these are the totals that I alluded to earlier on. Remember I said that the debtors collection schedule will fit into your cash budget as receipts from debtors. So what will you say? You'll say receipts from debtors for October, 141,150. What are we doing? We're adding all the components. Just another quick examination tip for you. Very often we find candidates leave out figures that are pre-populated. What do I mean by that? For example, you didn't calculate that figure. It was given to you already. Sometimes, just because, I don't know whether it's uh, because of the fact that it's pre-populated or because you didn't write it yourself, you tend to forget it when you are adding. So make sure that you add all these figures here to get you the, to the total of 141,150, and the same would apply to November. Clear? Right. Okay, we move on now to the next part of the question where it says, remember that's the business we are dealing with, and it says, Calculate the missing figures deno denoted by A to C on the budget. And the first one here is salaries. So that's the figure that we're calculating, the salaries figure. Okay, what information do we have regarding our salaries? Let's see. Salaries. The business has employed additional staff at a cost of 10,090 rand per month, effective from the 1st of November 2020. Okay, this means therefore, what are we going to do? Here we have our salaries for October, which was 55,000 that was given to you. You are expected to calculate the salary now for November. Right? Here we go. You start off by taking the figure that you have already, which was your 55,000. That was the previous month. Now you are told that you have a new employee, right? And they will have a salary of 10,090, as a result of which your new forecasted salary will be, obviously, what you do here is take your 55,000 plus 10,090, and that will then give you 65,090, as you can see here, there's your 65090. There's your 65090, which is your new salary that you, that you have forecasted in your budget period. Okay, so what have we done in this segment? We've shown you calculations on how to complete a debtors collection schedule and some figures that you need to complete the cash budget with. I'm sure we've piqued your interest and you want to know more about cash budgets, so stay with us. See you in a jiffy. Welcome back, accounting boffins. We're busy with a cash budget. Remember, just to give you a quick recap of what we were doing, we were calculating the missing figures, 
And there's the missing figure that we needed for our salaries, just to show you that that was what we calculated as our missing figure for A. Right, now we're calculating our payments to creditors. Okay, and this is what we do. The business keeps a fixed base stock of 175,000 rand. Goods are replaced monthly. That's what we mean by a fixed base stock. Goods are replaced on a monthly basis to ensure that we start off the next month with the same amount of stock that we had at the beginning of the month. Okay, the business uses a markup of 100% on cost. That's the markup. 35% of all stock is purchased on credit. Creditors terms are strictly 30 days. The business complies with these terms. So all of these are important considerations because they guide you as to how you will make your payments. Very important. Okay, so now what do we know? This is the information that we have, right? And we want to calculate our B. So immediately we say, fine, let's look at our September figure of 200,000, right? There's your actual sales figure, 200,000. Now remember, when it comes to payments to creditors, you need to determine your cost of sales, right? Very important, determine your cost of sales. So what do we do? Step number one, take your 200,000, which is your cost, your, your selling price, times 100 over 200. Remember, I showed you this before. I'm going to show you again. You take your cost price over your selling price times your actual selling price, and therefore, it's 100, which is my cost, over my selling of 200, and that gives me a figure of 100,000 rand. Okay, that's the first part of your calculation, determining your cost of sale. Right. The second part of your calculation would be, how do you pay? You're saying that 35% of all stock is purchased on credit. Creditors' terms are strictly 30 days. So if 35% of your stock is purchased on credit, then this is what we're now going to do. Watch. 35% times over 100. That means 35,000 Rand is the figure that you are looking for. And therefore... When you slot in your payments to your creditors, you can clearly see that that is the 35,000 rand that you are looking for. So once again, let's recap. When you're working out your credit purchases, step number one, take your total sales figure. Calculate your cost of sales. Once you have your cost of sales, you split it up into cash purchases and credit purchases. Your credit purchases will determine how you pay your creditors. Okay, moving on. Now we have to calculate. Um, this, this is what our debtors are granted 30 days to settle the accounts. The payment is 75% of all sales are on credit. And it is projected that our sales will be for September will be 180,000. Remember, we're calculating C. Let's go back into C. What is it that they wanted in C? They wanted our cash sales for November. There we go. Right. So if we're looking at the cash sales for November, remember what we want to do? We want to look at, immediately take into consideration that you have a figure that's given to you. We were given here. Here's the figure. The projected sales, uh, credit sales for September was 180,000 rand. You're looking at the component where you want the cash sales component. So obviously, if 75% of your sales are on credit, that means that you now have to use that figure that you have to calculate your missing figure. Watch. You take your 180,000 rand times... 25 over 75. The reason you are doing this calculation is to determine, watch here, let's just have a clear indication of what we have here. We want our cash sales for November. That's the figure that we're looking for. Okay, and we always take into consideration 
we always take into consideration that this is the information that you have regarding all your sales figures. And therefore, when you're working out, you, you calculate using the 180,000 Rand. And you, because you have the credit sales component, you can now calculate your cash sales component because that is what we, we are required to calculate, our cash sales component. Remember, using your credit sales, you work backwards to calculate your cash sales. And therefore, you would find that you would end up with a cash sales figure of 60,000. There we go. There's my cash sales for November. Okay. So this calculation tells you that you have to use given information, right? And using the given information, you go back to calculate the figure that you are looking for. So if you are given your credit sales, you know that that equals to 75%. Therefore, the cash sales would be 25%. And that is why, that is why the calculation looks like this here, right? Where the credit sales component was 180,000 Rand. Obviously, based on the information, here's it here. You can clearly see projected credit sales was 180,000 Rand. Therefore, using that, you can calculate your cash sales figure. Therefore, you have a cash sales figure of 60,000 Rand. Okay, so there we have now completed calculations. That was A, that was B, and that was C. So we have completed the missing figures that we needed to calculate it in our cash budget. Okay, back to our information. Live wire traders. Now there are certain aspects that Debbie Prince is concerned about. Let's look at her concerns and let's see if we can help her. Comment on the cash and credit sales. Explain how these amounts are affecting the cash flow of the business quote figures. My appeal to you, my humble appeal to you, is whenever the question says quote figures, you have to use figures from the given question to support your answers. Okay? That is important. So here we go. Our cash sales, we budgeted 55,000 for August, but it's only 42,000. Your credit sales, you budgeted 135,000, but your actual was 180,000, right? Your collection from your debtors was at, uh, budgeted 141, you only collected 86.5, and then obviously advertising, you budgeted 11, but you actually spent 22,000. Okay, now, obviously, if you look at cash sales, cash sales had a negative variance what do we mean by a negative variance? Let's go back and see that. Cash sales, negative, why? Because your actual was less than your budgeted. So clearly you can see it's a negative variance. You budgeted to receive or to have cash sales of 55,000, but you only had 42,000. So you had less, the actual was less than the budgeted. In this case here, a negative variance. Then, uh, the reason is the variance is 13,000 Rand, and where does it come from? The actual amount was 42,000, but it is less than the budgeted of 55. So, in other words, if you take 55,000 minus your 42,000, so you're taking your uh, budgeted of 55, actual of 42,000 gives you a variance of 13,000. This is what we mean by the variance. In this case, a negative variance, meaning less than the budgeted amount. Okay. The credit sales, on the other hand, had a positive variance, meaning of 45,000 Rand. What does it mean? It means that the actual amount was 180. So your budgeted was 135,000. That's what you budgeted for your credit sales, your actual was 180,000, giving you a variance of 45,000, meaning in this case here, a positive variance, meaning that your, 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 your actual 
was more than your budgeted. You can clearly see it here. Let me show it to you. Here, your actual was 180,000 and your budgeted was only 135,000, indicating to you that you had a positive variance. Okay, now, clearly you can see more customers were buying on credit as compared to cash sales. Now, what will this, this will have resulted in a surplus of cash for August. The bank balance will increase, obviously, by 32,000. How do we get that figure? Your 45,000 minus your 13,000. Clearly, you can see that these are the fact that you have budgeted, and it is different to your budget, means it's going to impact on your cash balances. Has the advertising campaign been beneficial to the business? Explain and quote figures. Once again, let's look at our advertising campaign. We budgeted 11,000, we spent uh, 22,000, therefore, yes, the actual advertising amount of 20,000 has been doubled, right? Has actually doubled from 5% to 10%. The sales has increased by 32,000 Rand, which is an increase of 14%. Therefore, the increased advertising did not increase your, it, it had an impact on part of your sales and on, it had a negative impact on the other part of the sales. So you can clearly see that one part of your sales increased and the other part of your sales decreased. So obviously, it means that it did, it certainly had an impact, but two different impacts if we're looking at your cash sales and your credit sales. Do you think that the collection from debtors is well controlled? Once again, let's look at our information. Collection from our debtors, we budgeted 141,150. We only received 86,500. Okay, so immediately you can see there's a negative variance. Why? We, ex we were supposed to receive, we budgeted to receive 141,150, but we only received 86,500. Okay, now, no, the collections of 86,500 are much lower than the expected 141,150. Again, look at what we're saying here. There's your budgeted figure, 141,150. There's your 86,500, which is your actual. So this is your budgeted figure, and this is your actual figure. Clearly, you can see that because your actual is less than your budgeted, it would definitely cause cash flow problems. In other words, it means that you, you in your cash budget, you're expecting to receive a certain amount of money, but here you are not receiving what you budgeted to receive, and therefore the variance is 54,650. You're receiving less than what you had budgeted for. Clearly, this is going to indicate to you that this will result in cash flow problems. How would we solve this problem? What can we do about it? Because clearly, the idea of a cash budget and a debtor's collection schedule is to plan, is to forecast to see how we can improve. How are we going to improve? One, ensure the debtors adhere to the policy by notifying them of their outstanding balances via WhatsApp, via SMS, whatever social media we can use, technology that we can use, informing them of their outstanding debt. Two, charge interest on overdue amounts. That means where a debtor is not settling his accounts timelessly, you charge interest. That means you increase the amount that they have to pay you. You do not allow for future credit to debtors who do not adhere to the required credit policy. In other words, if a debtor is not complying, then certainly you need to take some action, right? So you stop, say, okay, you, debtor A, you're not complying 
with the credit terms, you're not complying with, your, with the credit policy, therefore, we're going to stop all credit for you, to you, no more credit to you, until you come to the party, you start settling your debt, and then we will revisit your uh, credit uh, policy. So action needs to be taken. So understand, people, and this is important. One, it's not just the calculation of the cash budget and the debtors collection schedule, and it's something that you put aside. No, it requires action to be taken. And this action will ensure that we do not experience any cash flow problems. Okay, that brings us to the end of our lesson today. Let us recap and summarize what we have done in today's lesson. Number one, we looked at the primary differences between your cash budget and your projected income statement, right? So we clearly saw what items would feature in your cash budget and what would go into your projected income statement. Then we, we visited our receipts from our debtors where we looked at the debtors' collection schedule and we saw how we have to look at the calculations in terms of how are we expecting our debtors to pay us, what percentage in which month, and then obviously we did the calculations, so we updated the debtor's collection schedule. We also looked at the creditor's payment schedule, and you saw that like your debtor's collection schedule is dependent on credit sales, your creditor's payment schedule is dependent on credit purchases, but before credit purchases, it's dependent on the cost of sales because we are using base stock. Right. We then went on and we calculated certain missing figures in our cash budgets, and then we looked at variances. That means the differences between actual amounts and budgeted amounts. And more important, once we've calculated the variances, what actions are we taken to, uh, what actions will be taken to prevent cash flow problems and other challenges that may occur as a result of the variances that we have identified. From me, Ashraf Patel and the team, until our next lesson, keep your feet on the ground, reach for the stars, and always be an accounting shining star. Goodbye.